when it comes to treating arthritis, think outside the pill box. I chose this title specifically because I didn't want to talk about medicine. I wanted to talk about self-management of osteoarthritis. I won't hit on inflammatory arthritis directly. That is the rheumatoid arthritis and the other spondyloarthropathies. I do want to talk primarily about osteoarthritis tonight because everyone over the age of 40 at least has a side dish of osteoarthritis. Okay, so we all contend with a little bit of pain and discomfort that is osteoarthritis. It is the most common type of arthritis. As I said, most people over the age of 40 have at least a little bit. And as we age, it gets a little more common. It is the chronic degeneration of the joint. And I'm gonna go through some pictures so that you guys can see exactly what we're talking about when we talk about degeneration. The cartilage covering the ends of bones, and again, we'll see a picture, where it meets to form a joint set this down. So let's pretend this is the knee and we're going to talk about the knee a lot because it's a very obvious joint. So you have the long leg bone of the femur and you have the two smaller bones of the lower leg, the tibia and the fibula, and together they make a joint that moves together and bends as you bend, helps you bend. There's cartilage that's on the end of them that protects them and over time and with sometimes with overuse, that cartilage, that squishy spongy piece starts to wear down. So they rub against each other causing stiffness, pain, and loss of joint movement. About 27 million people in the United States have osteoarthritis. And it, again, it happens at all ages, but most common after the age of 65. And there are a set of risk factors. As you age, your risk is higher. People less than age 60, about 27 percent have some osteoarthritis. But once you get into the age group over 60, it increases to up to 50%, okay? A risk factor is obesity. And the more weight you have, the more stress on the weight-bearing joints, which can lead to degeneration, okay? Female gender, injury, and overuse. And for that one, I like to specifically um, have you consider a carpet layer. So somebody who's on their knees all day long, on those knees directly, that overuse, standing, kneeling, squatting, being on the knees like that, that kind of overuse can lead to degeneration osteoarthritis. Higher than someone such as a salesman for retail clothing, you know, they don't, they're walking and moving, they're keeping their, their joints more active. Weak thigh muscles, and we'll go through some exercises in this presentation tonight because thigh muscles are really important, and anybody that's ever been in the office with me knows that I talk about quadricep strengthening, okay? So we'll talk about that, and I'll show you those exactly. Genetics, some people just have a higher predisposition for osteoarthritis because it's in their family makeup. And then other disorders that contribute to osteoarthritis, such as the inflammatory arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, hemochromatosis, and then acromegaly. So there are some other disease processes that contribute to the development of osteoarthritis. Um, this one's a little bit um, highly specific, but I threw it in anyway. There's two kinds. There's primary or idiopathic osteoarthritis and secondary. So the primary is more like the family predisposition. It just happens without, without injuring it, without overusing it. It's just there. Okay? And it tends to be in joints of the hands, joints of the knees, your hips, your feet. Okay? <clears throat> Whereas secondary, that's more of that overuse. Or even some people who have the congenital abnormality, like kiddos who are born with hip dysplasia, they will automatically have a higher propensity to develop osteoarthritis. People with very short fingers actually have a higher rate of osteoarthritis in the hands, okay? All right, so common sites. Believe it or not, the base of the thumb down here is your number one joint for osteoarthritis in the body. And you'll meet folks, and you'll notice them in the grocery line even, that have significant or advanced arthritis here at the base of the thumb. And it becomes so it looks more prominent. It 
gets kind of square there. Knees, of course, hips, shoulders, your low back and neck, small joints of the fingers, the ankles and the feet, okay? So what does it look like? How does it feel? This is a super important takeaway point. Osteoarthritis and the pain and stiffness that come with it, that's a gradual process. It doesn't happen overnight. So if you have joint pain and stiffness that shows up just like that, that's not your osteoarthritis. That's something different and you should see your doctor about that or your nurse practitioner, okay? Um, it comes and goes. Some days are good, some days are bad. You'll, you'll know folks and maybe yourselves that, you know, when the weather changes, they get a little more stiff. You know, that's that come and go sort of feeling that osteoarthritis is. So things make it worse, things make it better. Soreness and stiffness with overuse. And that's really a key factor when we, as providers at the Arthritis Center, talk about arthritis symptoms with our patients. Do you wake up with stiffness? And does it get better with use? Or, and that would be the inflammatory type arthritis, or is your pain worse with activity? And if you think back to the little hand demo that I did at the beginning, if you imagine the more you use something and, and it's rubbing and rubbing and rubbing, it gets worse with activity. That is osteoarthritis, okay? If you have what we call moderate osteoarthritis, you're still able to do all of your activities of daily living. You're cooking, you're cleaning, you're showering, you're bathing, you're mopping the floor. It just hurts a little, but you're still able to do that. When it gets severe, then it's when you have difficulty walking, climbing stairs, sleeping because it hurts so much, and performing your basic tasks of daily living. Osteoarthritis almost never is the cause of sudden development of joint pain, stiffness, and swelling, as I said previously. And that's true for low back and neck pain from osteoarthritis too. Low back and neck pain from osteoarthritis don't just show up overnight. It is a very gradual process. So if you have sudden neck or back pain, that is almost never osteoarthritis, okay? <clears throat> okay, well, how is osteoarthritis diagnosed? Typically, this is done at your primary care <laughs> provider, your internal medicine provider. They talk to you about what makes your pain worse, what makes your pain better, when did it start, where is it located, how is it affecting your day? and then whether or not you have other medical problems that could be causing those symptoms, okay? They'll do a physical exam, so they'll check out your joints, they'll listen to your heart and lungs, they'll get a feel for, physically feel on your joints. If it's a big swollen joint, sometimes when we have very advanced osteoarthritis, we can get swelling with that, and, and I go like this because often it's the knee. Sometimes we'll pull out a little fluid from that joint that's swollen to make sure we don't have something like gout or pseudo gout or an inflammatory process like rheumatoid arthritis. So sometimes there is a joint aspiration. And then oftentimes there's an x-ray because we like to take a look at it. And I have some x-rays for you here tonight. Okay, so when we talked about the knees and I gave you the little hand demo, this is actually a little nicer than my hands because you can actually see this. So this is your long leg bone of the thigh and this is your tibia and fibula, the bones in your lower leg. So <coughs> where these meet, you have your meniscus, and this is your cartilage. This is that nice, smooth, spongy piece that goes over the end of the bones so the bones aren't rubbing together, okay? So that's a normal knee. It's a beautiful knee. But this is what happens when you get the degeneration. Here's your good knee again, and here's what happens to this cartilage, so it's degenerating. It's kind of, what, kind of like a shrink wrap on the end of it when you, when you imagine it like that. So it's wearing away. So you know that when you're bending and leaning and kneeling and squatting, these are going to be in contact with each other and that's going to hurt. Okay, I really liked this slide or these pictures when I found it because it does such a nice job of showing you a knee over time. So this is the very first time they took a knee picture. Now on an x-ray, 
the patella or the kneecap kind of just floats up here and it's not something you directly see over the front like you do in a drawing or what you would imagine and how you feel your knee, okay? Nine years later, we're starting to see that there's some bony spurs there and these two are getting closer together. 13 years, we have even more of those spurs and it's, you're losing that joint space. And I'm probably blocking you guys, sorry. And then by 19 years, look at this. It's really kind of collapsed on, on each other. This is a painful knee and this knee will treat and we'll treat as long as we can with our injections and things like that. But ultimately, this person needs to have their knee replaced at this point because this is going to be affecting their everyday. Okay, this is making stairs difficult. You're having trouble with stairs and rising from chairs even at this point. Okay. So I brought you a nice x-ray of a very good normal knee. And this is a child. And I know this is a child because they still have a growth plate Adults don't have that. Once you're grown up, you no longer have a growth plate. It's all one piece. But see this beautiful space here? There is so much, so much joint space. It's perfect. And this is your kneecap here. And there's also beautiful space here. Okay. Now let's see what osteoarthritis does to us. <coughs> Slam down on each other. Okay, so this is advanced osteoarthritis in the medial compartment or the inside of the knees. They still have decent joint space out here, but not here. This person has pain from their osteoarthritis. And it's interesting actually that it's really almost equal on both sides at the same time. Often we wear out one a little bit quicker than the other. So when they get to that point where it's time for a replacement, this is an x-ray after a knee replacement. So I kind of think these are neat to look at because when you take the x-ray of a, a replaced part, you get to see the metal or the plastic that's not porous like bone. So they <coughs> shave off the end here, they cement in the replaced parts, and then they often shave off the back of the kneecap because more than likely this person had arthritis between the patella and the femur. And when you get arthritis between those, they almost look like they're glued together. That, that would be advanced arthritis in the patellofemoral compartment. And that's why this is so flat. They've done a nice job and shaved it. The surgeon did. Okay, so then on to the hips. This is normal hip anatomy. It's a ball and socket joint. Fits in real nice in the pelvis. You can't see the joint space on a drawing like this like you can on the x-ray. Again, what happens in osteoarthritis is that cartilage begins to wear away. So you don't have a space anymore. You're getting more friction against the uneven surfaces of the bone. So x-ray of the normal hip, and I like this one because it gives you all the labels. But this is exactly what your drawing was in the slides before. It just gives you this in an x-ray format. So there's good joint space all through there. I think hips are a little harder to look at than the knees are. That's why I like the knees so much. But here, here you can see they don't have that good joint space anymore. It's really kind of clouded together. Okay, so they're, they're getting stiff in that hip. That's getting hard to get in and out of the car. Okay. And then that's what it looks like once the surgeon comes in and replaces it. And they make these so that you don't set off the alarms when you go through the security. So no worries there. Some of them do. Did I just hear that? <laughs> do you still set it off? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you have to carry around a card then. Okay. Um, shoulder is also pretty common for arthritis, especially when you think about your, your young people who are th throwing sports for a long time. They usually wear out those shoulders a lot faster than the rest of us do. Normal joint space. There's that worn out cartilage again. 
Shoulders are kind of nice on x-ray. You can see that there's a good joint space here and has some space between the cavity up there and the top of the arm bone. Not so much anymore here. This person has difficulty doing this. They have difficulty doing this. Maybe even putting their cups up into their cabinet. And then we have hands. And we all know somebody, at least, that has pretty advanced arthritis in their hands. It's a lifetime of use, but it's also a very much a genetic thing. There are just some people who have a higher propensity for very nodular arthritis, like this, okay? So this is not a rheumatoid arthritis. This is a regular osteoarthritis. I don't think they get their ring off anymore unless they had it remade with a little buckle on the back. And that, and that can be done. This is painful to do your activities of daily living, but often people with arthritis like this, it's been gradually, gradually, gradually happening, so they've learned to accommodate it. <coughs> okay, so here's the gist of what we're going to talk about tonight, and it's really your self-management strategies for osteoarthritis. What can you do without me as a provider? What can you do to manage your osteoarthritis pain and stiffness? Um, learning about osteoarthritis is the first thing, and that's why you're here tonight, so that's good. So self-management will go through a whole bunch. There's also physical and occupational therapy, and we'll talk about that a little bit. We send a lot of our patients to physical therapy, not as many to occupational therapy, but I'll explain it to you when we get to it. Um, manual mobilization is kind of, if anybody has a healthcare provider that's a DO rather than an MD, they often have learned manual mobilization in their osteopathic training. And there are a few um, physicians here in town that do this. It's, they probably wouldn't like it if I called it an offshoot of chiropractic. I'm sure they feel very different about each other, but there are things that are sort of similar. They just don't do the spinal manipulation, but they do a lot with the muscles and the joints. Quadriceps strengthening, remember I said I was going to say that a few times. Bracing and taping, and we'll go through that. Wearing the best shoes for your feet. I talk about this all the time. You know, we have patients who, who have arthritis in their feet, and instead of having their toes lay nice and flat, their toes are cocked up like this. Maybe you guys have them out in the audience. That foot needs a deep toe bed in their shoe, and they need a wide toe bed in their shoe to accommodate the change in their feet. They're a lot more comfortable that way. Pointy, narrow, high-heeled shoes, never a good thing. Um, a cane in your opposite hand. So if your arthritis in your hip is on the left, you're going to want to use the cane on your right. And we'll talk a little bit more about canes and walking sticks um, in a few more slides. And then acupuncture. Okay, weight loss. Number one thing that I always recommend, it's on almost all of my patients' chart, and I always say, weight loss is encouraged because for every pound of body weight that you can lose, you reduce the stress on your joints by five pounds. That's huge. So if you lose 10 pounds of body weight, you reduce the weight and stress on your knees by 50 pounds. Amazing. So if, if you can just lose a couple of pounds when you're overweight, it makes a huge difference in how those knees feel at the end of the day. Staying physically active is super important. And I know that all of these things that I'm going to say take a lot of work, but honestly, if you want to feel better, you have to really work hard at it. Just like you work hard at your job or did when you were still working before you retired, it takes a lot of work to be healthy. It doesn't happen automatically. When you're 15, it's still happening, but not once we grow up. <laughs> um, strong muscles actually protect your joint. Strong muscles can help absorb the shock. So that's why quadriceps strengthening is so important, but even all of your muscles. You know, even your arm muscles help with your shoulders. <coughs> it's important, and we'll talk about a little bit of weightlifting and things like that too. Nutritious diet. I have a slide about the anti-inflammatory diet because people often wonder about it. Managing stress and depression. Mood and pain share the same pathway in the brain. 
So if you can manage your mood, you will reduce your pain perception, okay? That's why there's drugs like Cymbalta. I'm sure you've seen the commercials. That drug is indicated both for chronic osteoarthritis pain and depression. They're the only ones that are dual indicated like that right now because they're a newer drug. The older drugs, the antidepressants, they still do the same thing. They just didn't go to the FDA with that idea because it was, you know, 20 some years ago when they made their drug. Balancing, act, balancing rest and activity each day. So you have to have a little bit of exercise and some rest because you can't go, go, go all day because your joints will hurt. Because remember, the more active, or excuse me, the more you're busy with those joints, the sore that they get. Okay, so you have to balance that. Over the counter medications, and we'll talk about things like Osteobiflex and other glucosamine products, and then we'll talk a lot about topicals because I'm very into topicals. <clears throat> warm baths and warm soaks. I tell you what, warm soaks for the hands, if any of you have hand arthritis, doing the dishes is actually a good thing. <laughs> and it feels nice, right? And that's why a hot bath feels good, a hot shower feels good. <clears throat> we also talk a lot about paraffin wax baths on our side of the hall. Um, a paraffin wax bath basically looks like a crock pot and it has hot wax in it. And it, you know, you warm it up, you plug it in, warm it up, and you just submerge your hands in that wax and that helps kind of pull out all that stiffness. Very helpful. It can be a little messy, but if you can deal with the mess, it's wonderful. $39.99 at Bed Bath & Beyond. <laughs> Use your coupon that comes in the mail. <laughs> um, cold packs, always helpful. Everyone should have an ice pack in their freezer. Massage, rest, Protection, and by that I mean splints. And I have several um, slides about splints too because when something hurts, you should rest it and immobilize it. And immobilize it means a splint, a splint or a wrap of some sort. Music is helpful. Music is a coping strategy to deal with pain. Laughter is just like it too. Yoga and Tai Chi and other warm water exercises. We have a couple of places here in town and I know not everyone's probably from Lincoln, but Warm water exercise is a wonderful thing. And if your pool doesn't have a, if your fitness facility doesn't have a warm water pool, consider buying a, a shorty scuba suit. You can find them like at Sam's Club and that'll keep you warmer, especially our folks who have a little bit of that rain on. So um, the cold water is no good for them. Consider that, be worth, worth it. Okay. So physical therapy. Some of you may have already been to physical therapy. Like I said, we send a lot of folks and a lot of it's for knees and hips. So here is the PT world's um, definition of themselves. Basically, they're, they're helping to repair and remediate or make well impairments and disabilities and then promote mobility, functional ability, quality of life, and movement. So they, you know, they examine you, they evaluate you, and then they figure out a plan to do different stretches and different strength building exercises. And physical therapy also uses a lot of their, mo what, we, what they call modalities. I call it their tool belt. You know, they have ultrasound, they have TENS units, they have cold packs, warm packs, um, ice baths, all sorts of things in their toolbox that they use. And they're excellent at it. So I always recommend physical therapy. Nobody has ever complained about physical therapy. They always get at least one good nugget out of it. The hard part is doing the things that they teach you as your home exercise program on a regular basis. Everybody stays faithful for a while and then they eventually, oh yeah, no, I haven't done that for a while. Um, occupational therapy. Um, we, don't, we don't utilize occupational therapy as much, but it's valuable. So imagine that hand that was all bent up with arthritis. How much easier a spoon with an adapted handle on it would be to grasp and use instead of the skinny spoon that comes naturally, okay? So again, using the toothbrush, because you know they got, they're stiff. Those knuckles were big. Those are stiff and they don't get that fine motor anymore. So occupational therapy helps with daily activity adaptations. And we also carry a magazine in all of our exam rooms that ha is full of stuff like this. 
um, adaptive aids, we call them. Um, this is the manual mobilization, and this is what I was talking about with the um, physicians who are DOs rather than MDs, and they learn this. They do them, chiropractors do them, osteopath is the DO. Um, occupational therapist and physiotherapist. I'm going to get my little cheat cheat from my notes here because I want to give them credit for, for what it is exactly. Because there's mobilization is slightly different than manipulation. So manipulation is the artful introduction of rapid rotational shear or distraction force into the joint. So it's all on the outside, but it's rapid rotational movements. <clears throat> Sometimes you can hear popping with that, which is an interesting thing. I'm, I think that would make me a little nervous, but it's just gas bubbles. You don't have to worry about it, but it would still make me nervous. Um, whereas mobilization is slower, more controlled process of articular and soft tissue um, stretching. Myofascial therapy is also this kind of manual mobilization. And then, of course, massage. And hopefully, you've all had an opportunity to have massage. It's, it's a wonderful thing. I just wish insurance companies would pay for it because so many people would benefit from it because it really feels good. So there's a picture. That looks a lot like physical therapy to me. Yeah. OK, um, chiropractic. Anybody see a chiropractor? Yeah. Um, Dr. Valente and myself, we're, we're fine with chiropractic. Our thought is, if it helps you, doesn't hurt you, and makes you feel better, go ahead. There are a few types of arthritis that are very advanced, especially in the, in the neck and the back, that we would say, no, this is not a good idea in this particular case. But the average person, totally fine. So they manipulate the spine, and they do adjustments, they call them. But they also use some modalities, too, just like physical therapy, heat, the TENS units, and the ultrasound. And they always do an x-ray themselves, or they have an x-ray from you. They always take a look at those bones. OK, here's my buddy, quadriceps strengthening. OK, everyone can do quadriceps strengthening. Often in the office, we talk about wall sits. But that takes a lot of balance and strength. And it, when you're new to quadriceps strengthening, this is like a modified wall sit. Like I said, not everybody can do this right out of the gate. But everybody can do this, OK? So if you sit and you do your feet like this, and you raise that up to straight, and you hold it for 10 seconds, and lower it back down, and then do it again for another 10 seconds, and do 10 reps of that, and then switch legs, that's going to help build the strength in those thighs. Now, later when I have a couple of more slides on quadriceps, I'll show you that this can be done even without having to do the kick out like that. You can do it just by flexing that muscle as you lay on the floor. And eventually, you'll build up to more. Bracing and taping can be very helpful for those particular patients who have these are normal, OK. This view is the patient's knee bent, and the x-ray camera comes this direction. So this is showing you the kneecap, how it floats in space, in the knee space. This is normal. It sits kind of in this nice dip here. Some people have very displaced kneecaps. So this, is, this guy's way out here. That can be painful, especially with activities. So what? taping does is they, and this picture does it nicely, so it's all displaced on this one. Then they use their special tape, looks like this, sometimes they're colored, and they move that patella back into its normal position of function so it's less painful. That's what taping does. That's done by physical therapist. And then we also have braces or knee supports, okay? There are several kinds. When we have pain that's in the, the center part of the knees, that's the medial piece, a lot of times we'll use this big unloader brace. This is a big apparatus. So not everybody would wear this. This tends to be a, a, an advanced arthritis that's really interfering with 
um, daily activities. If you have kneecap pain, sometimes we'll use a soft kind of neoprene sleeve with a cutout for the kneecap so the kneecap goes and sits in that hole properly. And then general knee supports are these like the blue one, that's a neoprene sleeve and it supports the knee and gives you a little bit of compression. Whereas if you had strong quadriceps, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, um, ankles then. We use a lot of ankle braces. This is our lace and Velcro or ASO brace. This one works really awesome for people who have unstable ankles. <clears throat> it takes a lot of work to put it on and off, and it ha takes a shoe that accommodates it, but not, it's not too bad. I don't think you really have to buy a bigger shoe. You just have to have one that's um, got a nice opening at the top. And then neoprene and Velcro also. And then for our hands, with our hand arthritis, these are ring splints, okay? And they're fashionable yet functional. This kind of splint we often use with our folks with carpal tunnel because we like to keep that, that wrist nice and straight, but they're generally sold in a position of function, kind of cocked like that. So those are for folks who have osteoarthritis of the wrist that really interfere with their activities of daily living. This is a thumb spica splint, and this helps with our folks with that CMC joint arthritis, that number one joint in the body for osteoarthritis. It keeps that thumb in a position that's neutral, and so you can't wiggle waggle your thumb all day doing your activities, which causes your pain. But you can't wash your hands with it, so a lot of people don't tolerate it during the daytime. Okay, correct footwear, and I already talked about the wide, wide toe beds and the deep toe beds. <laughs> and avoiding high heels and pointed shoes. And then when you have the bunions or the ha hammer toes and the hallux valgus, bunion is hallux valgus, and that's that big, you know, it looks like your toes are actually doing this and it gets real bony on the sides. That needs a wider shoe. You know, your, your toes no longer straight up and down anymore. It's doing this and making this big bump on the side. So you gotta have wider shoes, otherwise it's gonna hurt. Um, don't tie your shoes too tightly, and don't wear binding shoes. And we even have a relacing trick for people who have arthritis at the top of their foot that it's real painful to wear their tied shoes. We relace shoes so it goes around that prominent part of the foot. I do it myself on my shoes. And then if you have pain from your toe arthritis, don't go barefoot. What I always tell my patients is, when you're born, your foot's nice and flat, and if this part of my hand corresponds to the, the base of your toes, that's your metatarsal joint, when you get arthritis, they start to cock up. Okay, these are hammer toes then. When it cocks up, then you're striking on a part of your foot that you were not designed to strike on. That's why it's so painful. That's why barefoot is bad news, okay? I even tell my patients to put an insole in their slippers at home or buy a slipper that has a formed sole in them. Canes and walking sticks, best thing ever. But the important piece is you have one that fits your body properly. Basically, the main thing is the top of your cane should be about the same level as the crease of your wrist. If it's too long, it's going to take more work to pick it up and move it. If it's too short, it's going to throw you off balance. Okay? So you've got to have your cane, your top of your, top of your stick, right about the crease of your wrist. Okay? Of course, we have the single. And then these that I love, three or four footed walking sticks, those are nice. A little more stable. I'm sure you've seen the commercials for the hurry cane. I haven't actually seen one live, but the last commercial I saw, they have them in bling now too. They're like hot pink and sapphire blue and all of this, so you get to have a fashionable color too. Acupuncture, anybody ever had acupuncture? Yeah, like it, love it, okay. So basically um, ancient Chinese medicine and 
it's supposed to get your energy flow back properly to help relieve your pain. And many, many, many people get relief from acupuncture. Haven't had it myself, so I can't speak to how it feels, but again, lots of people have had it and get a lot of relief. The American College of Rheumatology does support the use of acupuncture. Activity. Now remember that before you go and start an activity program, you need to check in with your primary care provider and make sure your heart and lungs are going to tolerate your activity. Okay, so make sure you have a good physical. Set modest goals to start. Walking is so important, I can't say enough about it. Start with 10 minutes, three days a week. And then slowly increase each time till you're walking 30 minutes, five days a week. It's amazing. And we'll talk a little bit more about walking. But be modest about your goals because if you say, yeah, I'm going to walk 60 minutes, three days a week right out of the gate, well, you will for about three weeks and then it'll be not something you stick with. So you have to do something that's manageable and achievable. Okay? If you have somebody that you stay accountable to, an exercise buddy, you'll also keep doing it longer than if you were doing it alone. So if you can find somebody in your one of your friends, one of your relatives that, that calls you up and says, okay, you ready? You're going to walk longer. You're going to go to the gym longer. You're going to do whatever that activity is, tennis, whatever it is, longer if you have a buddy. Give yourself some rewards. Give some of that massage therapy or a pedicure or something. Don't reward yourself with food because remember, body weight and stress on the weight-bearing joints, okay? And then um, make your activity non-negotiable. And that's what I tell my patients too. It has to be a lifestyle change. You just have to do it. And you have to do whatever it is it takes to do it. For myself, what it meant for me was I had to join a gym that was basically right outside my door because then I had to go past it every day and deal with that guilt if I wasn't going. So if you can make it a non-negotiable part or what I do now is I just roll right out of bed and walk on the treadmill. Because if I didn't do that, then I would procrastinate and I wouldn't get it done. Because I'm human like the rest of us. And then um, picking the right time based on your symptoms. If your arthritis is worse in the morning and you feel better in the afternoon, well, do your activity in the afternoon. The Arthritis Foundation actually has a program called Walk With Ease, and I really recommend the use of the Arthritis Foundation website. They have oodles of tools, and they have so much information. It's, it's amazing. And they have this program, and I really recommend it. Water workouts, so swimming is great, and the warm water arthritis classes like we talked about. I just want to throw a little piece out that swimming is wonderful because it's non-weight bearing and it's good for your heart and lungs. However, if you also have osteoporosis or osteopenia, we like you to have weight-bearing exercise, so you still need to walk. Um, stationary or recumbent bicycles are nice. I have a lot of folks who use the New Step machine, also very good. Um, yoga and Tai Chi, that's also nice because you have a social component there. You have friends, you have buddies. Um, resistance training, and that includes the resistance bands, and also light little weights, little hand weights. I'm not saying do 50 pounds. I'm saying just do three or five, okay? Little resistance. And then keeping your motivation, because as I've been saying, it's hard to stay on your program. But as long as you commit to yourself, make it non-negotiable, hopefully that will keep you motivated. Walking is your perfect activity. Why is it perfect? Because it's good for your joints. It's good for your heart, it's good for your lungs, it's good for your mood, and it's good for your friendships, okay? I can't say enough about walking. It's the best medicine ever, and I say it every single day to every one of my patients. All I needed to do was walk. And it's free, that's the best part. Except in Nebraska, you know, we do have the weather to contend with, and that gets hairy. Okay, so we talked about, um, goal setting for your exercise, starting small, being realistic, picking something that's manageable. If during that exercise you're not having pain, go a little bit further 
And even if you do have some mild muscle soreness, it's okay to work through it. I'm not talking about pain that makes you double over. I'm talking about just a little bit of muscle fatigue. Um, Over-the-counter pain relievers like Tylenol and ibuprofen or naproxen are good to help the soreness, but don't go out and take ibuprofen and naproxen unless you know that you have good kidneys, okay? Because those can irritate them. And then ice, of course. Strength and flexibility are important as we age because it helps us prevent falls. The American College of Sports Medicine is very big about strength and flexi flexibility exercises as we age because if you trip and you're strong and you're flexible, you can catch yourself and prevent that fall where you might break that hip. Whereas if you don't have strong muscles or flexible muscles, you're Falling over may just end up in an injury that um, sets you back for a while, like a hip fracture. Lifting the light weights, and then again, yoga and tai chi. And yoga is not just for those skinny 20 year old girls, you know, it's for everybody. And they have classes in yoga, oftentimes at the um, senior residences, you know, the um, older adult apartments, a lot of times they have classes. And not only are they yoga, um, but they might call themselves something else like strength and fitness, but it's a lot of the same principles, breathing and stretching and strength. And of course your Tai Chi. Obviously you can't do Tai Chi outside in Nebraska in the winter, but there are classes at the YMCA, okay? <coughs> so here's the part about the anti-inflammatory diet because a lot of people read about it and they ask about it. Is there some merit to it? Perhaps. And again, if it makes you feel good and it doesn't hurt you, we're all for it, okay? So here are the basic tenets of the anti-inflammatory diet. It's the omega-3s. We all hear about the omega-3s because heart disease also has a large inflammatory component. And that's why the, you'll see a lot about the omega-3s in relationship to heart disease. But it's inflammatory process is also in arthritis. So there's your omega-3s, and you can both eat fish and take the fish supplements. Now, from what I understand, if you're somebody that has issues with the, um, the belching of the fish, I heard that if you freeze your fish um, capsules and then take them, it's less. So you can try that. Nuts and seeds, a little handful of nuts and seeds every day is good, good for you. Those are, those are the kind of fats that are the positive fats. Okay. Of course, your fruits and vegetables, five servings every day. And you got to choose your good ones. The more colorful, the better. Blueberries, blackberries, strawberries, spinach, all of those deep colored ones. Iceberg lettuce, just water. That's just fun filler. It's not, there's no vegetable um, uh, value there. Olive oils because it's the monounsaturated fat, like the extra virgin olive oils. Use that for cooking instead of a vegetable oil. And then beans. Um, they're good for fiber, they're good for protein. That's all of your beans. That's your red beans, your black beans, your garbanzos, all of those. And that's not an everyday thing necessarily. The recommendation in the anti-inflammatory diet I read on the Arthritis Foundation website recommended a cup twice weekly or more. And you know, beans can be a meat substitute. Okay, so then we get to what kinds of things can you do to manage your pain? Cold. Cold therapy is awesome. This is your ice, okay? It can relieve your sore muscles and joints because what it does is it numbs those sore areas, <clears throat> it reduces the swelling, it can reduce the inflammation because it constricts the blood flow to the injured area because of the, the cold constricts the blood vessels, then all those products of inflammation can't get through. You can use the cold packs that you buy just off the shelf, or you can make your own, the water bottle filled with ice and cold water, or just a couple of doubled up baggies. Those work too. And then they, oh, there's the doubled up baggies there. A washcloth or a hand towel dipped in the cold water and ice, or everybody's favorite, the bag of peas, okay? That's portable and it's moldable. That's what's nice about the peas. Corn works too. Okay, heat, on the other hand, relaxes your muscles. We always use cold when we have something that hurts kind of new and sudden. We don't use heat. 
heat's more of that chronic sort of achy sort of thing because it dilates the blood vessels and lets the blood flow come in. You get more oxygen and nutrients that way to your muscles, which <coughs> ultimately the heat decreases the cessation of pain. Again, you have your commercial heat packs, the heating pads, and the hot water bottles. Most heating pads bought commercially right now have automatic timers that shut off because I will tell you, people get burned by heating pads that they're using that don't have an automatic shutoff valve that they left on and fallen asleep. So be very careful. Soaking in the hot bathtub and standing in the hot shower, we talked about that. Hand towel in the warm water, then on the painful joints. The hot tubs, the saunas, again, don't forget the dishes in case it's your hands. And this, this is really what I'm talking about, being careful. You know, you can have thermal injuries to the skin from cold and from heat, so be careful with your cold packs. Only use them for about 10 or 15 minutes at a time. <clears throat> and then always put some sort of fabric between the, the, the ice itself and your skin. Don't ever put them on open cuts or sores. If you're somebody who has Raynaud's, which is the color change in pain with the cold, Cold therapy is not really a good thing for you, so I would avoid that. Uh, or if you have vasculitis, which is inflammation of the blood vessels. Poor circulation in the lower extremities, you don't want to use that in the, in the body where you have poor circulation. And always check your temperature. Okay, um, we're going to talk about creams here in a second, but one of the things that's really important too when you're using hot and cold is don't use hot or cold right after you apply a cream or a gel or a lotion because then you have a, a, a physical reaction between them and you can end up with a thermal burn again. We talked about the thermal burns with the heating pads and then of course don't make your water too hot because you can get dizzy in there and we don't want you to fall down in your shower. Okay. Now we get to the topical rubs, and I have all sorts of info here. Now, most of the um, topical arthritis rubs are counter irritants, meaning they have menthol and camphor, and the methyl salicylate actually is uh, like a non-steroidal type of anti-inflammatory, but it's the menthol and the camphor that really ha um, are the counter irritant, which means they're causing a cold sensation, which diverts your attention to that and away from what is causing your pain. So it causes an irritation, it's a positive irritation that's against or other than your actual pain. Okay, so it diverts your pain perception. And then the salicylates, like the methyl salicylate, are often in many of them, and we'll talk about it. It's, it's like aspirin in its pain relieving function. <coughs> So here's one of the newer ones. And here is, my, here is my thought on topical rubs. If it makes you feel better and it doesn't hurt you or cause rash, then please use it. I'm all about topical rubs. They're readily available. There's many, many, many of them. And so they're all worth a try. I have a lots of folks who have been using the Blue Emu. There's a lot that are using the Australian Dream. And then there's the classics, and we'll talk about all those. So Blue Emu has glucosamine in it and MSM, which is really, you know, it's not scientifically proven, it's just one of those ingredients where they've been using it and they think that it really works well, so they keep adding it in. Plus it has aloe vera and the emu oil, I think they mostly just use as their, their foundation for their cream. It's not so much that it has any sort of medicinal quality. So it's deep penetrating. <coughs> Then there's your Australian Dream, and they use a product called histamine dichloride, and then that increases your histamine, dilates the blood vessels, so that again increases your blood flow to the area where you're rubbing it in, and that can cause you to have some pain relief. Flexol has been around a while. They use a mentholated, mentholated aloe vera formula but their main ingredient is the menthol. So again, that's a counter irritant. Your menthol gives you the cold sensation. So divert your attention away from your, the root of your pain. 
Biofreeze is something we talk about a lot. We always talk about Biofreeze and Icy Hot because they're the go-tos, they're the standards, but I also recommend all the others. Um, they use menthol also. That's their main ingredient, so that's that counter-irritant menthol, the cold sensation. They have multiple formulations too, the creams, the gels, the lotion, the sprays, the roll-on. I mean, there's all sorts of ways to get your, your topical onto your joints. Icy Hot, also a plethora of product formulations. Their main thing is menthol, as you would guess. And then they have menthol and camphor. And then there's also one that has menthol, menthol and methyl salicylate, that aspirin-like ingredient. Again, balm, spray, patches, and then the standard creams and gels. Asper cream, a tried and true classic. This one comes in a cream and a lotion, and that is a trolamine salicylate, so not the methyl salicylate. Same idea, aspirin-like ingredient. And they have the gel and the roll-on, and the main ingredient there is the menthol. Bengay, also been around a long time, and they're on the bandwagon also because now they have all of these various products, and there's more. I just couldn't fit them all. Okay, so. Not only do they have this, um, the roll-on kind, but they even have this roll-on with this applicator that's got these little nubbins on them. So, and uh, of course their marketing strategy too is the, the no smell, because everybody knows what Bengay smells like. Some people like it, some people don't. Um, the Ultra Strength comes with the three ingredients, the camphor, the menthol, and the methyl salicylate. salicylate. The zero degrees, the vanishing scent, which is that one with the nubbins, I think. Um, pain relief plus massage and cold therapy all contain menthol. The greaseless has menthol and methyl salicylate, salicylate, and the patch only has the menthol, okay? Patch usually is left on for several hours, convenient. Salon Pause is another one that I talk about a lot because it has these nice patches and they come in big ones for your back my husband uses this, loves it. And then they have the smaller ones for your, your smaller areas so you don't have to use such a big piece. They also have the jet spray and the gel and then their standard um, patches. <coughs> menthol, camphor, menthol salicylate. But the hot patch comes with menthol and capsaicin, which is from red hot chili peppers. So we get a little, little heat there. Thermacare is a little bit different because it's not a menthol and it's not a counter irritant, it's actual heat. It is generated by an interaction between iron, oxygen, and water. So again, when you have heat that dilates the blood vessels and then you have good blood flow which can help with healing, okay? They also have a cold, that's the blue one. And that also use, I think it's also the iron and the oxygen but in a different formulation. But it doesn't have the, the, what they call it, the icy shock of traditional cold packs. So it's a slower release and a constant temperature. It doesn't act like regular ice packs where it eventually becomes room temperature and it's no longer effective. These patches are usually six to eight hour patches. Then the capsaicin. As I mentioned, the main ingredient of hot chili peppers. So it's a topical heat therapy. All those other ones with the menthol, all cold therapies. Capsaicin is a heat therapy, and it also comes from different um, manufacturers. They're available widely, but know this about the capsaicin. You're going to have heat, and some people just don't like that stinging, burning sort of feeling, but usually you will get used to it after a couple of weeks, so you might try it. Everybody's got their own um, idea of what feels better to them. I don't know about the smell. I have not actually had the product in my hands, so I can't speak to that. Here's something new that I found when I was making this presentation, and that Icy Hot is making a reusable over-the-counter TENS unit. So TENS unit used electrical stimulation to also <coughs> reduce the pain sensation. Usually the TENS units are something that the physical therapist sets you up with and you rent it or eventually maybe your insurance company will let you um, 
purchase one it's a lot of hoops to jump through but it's happened a few times but now i see this so i'm kind of excited about it and i'm i'm waiting for my first patient to try out the reusable tens unit that's available over the counter without a prescription because for a tens unit from the physical therapist it requires a provider prescription so i'm excited about this i haven't seen it in the store yet just on the internet Um, I don't know why I added another one of these, but it's the same sort of thing as the um, hot and cold. Read your package insert, make sure you're following the directions, keep it out of your eyes, keep it out of your mouth. Really, wash your hands right afterwards because you just forget and then you might touch your eye. Don't use the bathroom without washing your hands either. I've had a, a story of an episode of that. Not good. Um, <laughs> Don't put them on or near wounds or damaged skin. Don't use them along with a heating pad, again, because you can have a, a physical reaction and have a burn. Don't put a tight bandage over it, okay? And those are designed to have some um, porous air exchange. Uh, there's about the washing your hands and avoiding the eyes. If you're allergic to aspirin or you're taking blood thinners, don't use a product that has those salicylates in it unless you talk to your doctor. Glucosamine and chondroitin. This is a popular one, both for humans and for animals. Our dog uses glucosamine biscuits for his joints. It actually works pretty good. Here's our take on glucosamine and chondroitin. And this is just Dr. Valente and myself. I can't speak for the others. Some people get relief from glucosamine and chondroitin. Some people just don't. If you're somebody that does get relief, great, keep using it. If you're somebody that hasn't noticed a lick of difference since you started using the glucosamine as directed on the bottle, then stop using it. You're wasting your money, okay? Everybody is different. Um, usually, it's about 1,500 milligrams total in a day. You have to be careful if you have asthma or diabetes, hypertension, and all of those that you see there. Again, anything you put in your mouth, you always need to know, have to know about your medical problems otherwise you know, because anything that comes in has to go through your system, not like a topical where you don't have to worry about it so much. You don't have to worry about your kidneys because you're using Icy Hot, okay? Whereas if you're putting something, you're ingesting something, including anything that's a vitamin, mineral, supplement type thing, you should know about whether or not your body's going to handle it. Avoid it if you take antiplatelets or anticoagulants or diabetic medications. Pregnancy and lactation, avoid it. Um, <clears throat> if it helps without causing side effects, go ahead and keep using it. Osteobiflex is a glucosamine and chondroitin product. It's just marketed more than the generics. A lot of people are familiar with it. Um, from my own personal world, you know, I have somebody who has taken it for years and when they stopped taking it, really missed it, so they still take it. The other person didn't make a lick of difference, so they aren't using it anymore. And they come in different formulas. There's even one with vitamin D in it, which of course we like as people who protect your bones. There's other ones that have um, this joint shield, which has this MSM, and that's one of those little things that I told you that it's not really scientifically proven to be helpful, but they must be finding it in their small studies. All right, so now, to, oh, how are we doing on time? Oh my goodness, it's eight o'clock? Okay. I'll be quick. Okay, there are lots of knee exercises and I put a whole bunch in here, but they're all available on the Arthritis Foundation website. So I encourage you to use them because basically we're, we're stretching and we're strengthening, okay? And if you want me to go through these with you after I'm finished, then I will be happy to do that. Calf stretches. This is the one where you can lay on the floor and just tighten that thigh muscle instead of doing those lifts when you're sitting in the chair. Seated hip march, basically you're marching in your place, but you're holding that leg up for a little while. It's not just going up and down. Pillow squeeze, you can, that one's pretty obvious. You just squeeze the pillow between your knees, release, and then squeeze again about 10 times. Heel raises, and you see you can do that with the chair, so you don't have to worry about your balance. 
side leg raises that helps these muscles out here sitting to stand people with knee arthritis the rising from a seated position is real difficult so again this is helping build those muscles up one leg balance step ups um, you can do those on a regular stair too, holding your banister you don't need those exercise um, risers we always recommend low impact exercise biking swimming the aerobics we talked about that the arthritis exercise classes again a lot of places that um, have community living also have these exercise classes and they're really wonderful low impact on the weight bearing joints so when do you need help if you've done all of these things but you still have pain because it's no longer helping then that's when you need to come and see us come and see your primary care doctor your internist whichever but if you have sudden swelling warmth or redness with pain that's when you need to see your health care provider right away or joint pain with fever or rash got to see your physician or nurse practitioner right away severe pain that prevents you from using the joint you got to make an appointment okay Oops. Um, this okay I admit it I actually put a little bit about medication at the very end but basically you know we individualize it the whole idea is to control the joint pain and stiffness to improve your function because we want you to stay an active member of your world you know it's good for your head and good for your heart to stay active okay <clears throat> so what we do is we reinforce and encourage the self-management all those things that we just talked about staying well exercising and all those non-pharmacologic or non-prescription things using the local pain relievers those are those topicals like we talked about there's also some um, prescription strength topical rubs that we will um, prescribe sometimes and those are compounded rubs typically there's one that's just diclofenac which is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory and that one's readily available pre-made in the pharmacy so we try some oral medications we do the rubs we might do injection therapy especially on those knees physical and occupational therapy and then once you have advanced disease that's no longer responding to any of the other non-farm plus what we're doing then it's time for surgery oftentimes so Tylenol is our best friend we love Tylenol it's not hard on the kidneys and your topical therapies plus the other non-pharmacologic therapies the exercise all of those things and then maybe the injections and then if you have good kidneys we may add a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory that's your ibuprofen that's your naproxen Aleve um, the diclofenac all of those on the bottom Celebrex is a good guy too a little less hard on the stomach um, speaking of the stomach some of these can be cause gastric irritation and a lot of times we'll also prescribe a proton pump inhibitor like a Prilosec with those <coughs> anybody here had a steroid injection in their knee yeah so you know okay so those work very nicely for a lot of people it's temporary though and really it's just a bridge if you're trying to delay your knee replacement surgery for a while it works pretty well there's also the rooster comb injection way at the beginning of this presentation I talked about sometimes the osteoarthritis um, not having as much of the hyaluron in the synovial fluid this is hyaluronic acid it's a gel we inject we use typically use one in a uh, it's 60 C's about this much in the syringe and it's more like the texture of um, molasses you know it's not a thin liquid like a steroid would be it's more like a molasses and the whole idea is to act more like the body's natural synovial fluid if this works for you for six months fantastic we'll repeat it if it doesn't give you six months of relief it's not repeated insurance companies won't let us do it the science that's out there that says if it doesn't help for that length of time then it's not going to help this patient okay we always chase it with a little steroid so we don't cause a post-injection inflammation um, so Balta I talked about somewhere at the beginning because this is the one that's dual indicated for chronic osteoarthritis pain and depression and it's been shown to reduce pain and improve function in knee osteoarthritis alone or when added to your NSAIDs like your ibuprofen um, naproxen diclofenac etc 
Um, nausea, fatigue, constipation, dry mouth, decreased appetite. That really, that's like the side, potential side effect for everything that you put in your mouth. <laughs> everything can cause those things. But those are common for the Cymbalta. It's available in a generic form now, the duloxetine. It's just only been in the last several months, and we're starting to use it more now because Cymbalta, when it was branding, was very expensive. Some pharmacy plans don't have good coverage yet for it, and it's still costing a lot. So we can try it. We can always try it. Um, but sometimes it's just re resource prohibitive for the patient. OK. So if you've done all of that, you've had your injections, you've done your exercise, you're using your topicals, you're using your ice, you're using your heat, and it's just not helping anymore, sometimes it's just time for you to have that joint replacement surgery. Um, we will occasionally add a narcotic or an opioid analgesic, but we try to avoid that. Okay? And there are a lot of new rules from the government about hydrocodone, and it's just making it more difficult for patients. So we really try to do as much as we can without having to use an opioid analgesic like a hydrocodone. Um, but when we do, it's the smallest possible dose for the smallest, um, shortest time possible. But we do like our tramadol. That one works pretty well without being on that same prescribing level that the government changed starting October 6th. We can still do tramadol a little easier. And it works well for a lot of people. We always have them take it with extra strength. Tylenol extends its therapeutic benefit. And then there's a whole bunch of new things out there that they're looking at in science, and I won't um, blow through that with you, but just know they're always trying to figure out something else that will help the osteoarthritis. <laughs> they're, you know, they do a lot of things with um, the joints in horses and things that they don't do in humans, but maybe eventually um, they'll get to us. Because I know I've talked to people who've had the platelet-rich plasma injections to their horses. And they use um, the uh, hyaluronic acid injections in all the joints, or at least several of the joints in horses, and we don't do anything except knees. So anyway, there's a lot out on the um, forefront for the treatment of osteoarthritis. Now, questions? Yes? I've been using the blue EMU and I uh -huh. use BioFreeze. Both of them say more than, not more than two or three times a day. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, really it's about irritation. And really the others, um, probably the other additional ingredients that are in it, they hadn't studied it long enough for, for them to know if you apply it more than that many times in a day if it will react with the skin or cause other side effects because really they generally only, when they, when they study it and the government allows them to put it out on the market, 